Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's all you wanted to do it. Well, good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming and joining us today. I'm standing here with Jackie Reed, CEO of Create Foundation, and many of our wonderful Create Young consultants. Create is such an amazing advocate for young people who are in care, and they've joined me here today to make a historic announcement for young people in care. It is my great privilege to announce that Queensland will extend support to young people in care to the age of 21. And I make this, um, this commitment with these beautiful young people behind me very proudly because today when young people come into the system, when they turn 18, they're considered adults and they no longer have the support of the system. When they're 18, if they're in family-based care, we did extend it to 19. But for those young people who are in non-family based care, 18 years of age is when they transition to adulthood. And what they've said to me is that it's too young. Many of them are transitioning and they're alone. And uh, I meet with Create Consultants often. They talk to me about their lived experience in care. And they were very clear and have been very clear to me over these past 20 months since I was the minister. And one cop that they need more support. One of the comments that really has always stayed with me, and Julia, it might have been you, I know you'll speak in a moment, I'm not sure, but one of the consultants said to me, Minister, you have two young boys, and when they turn 18, they won't be alone. They still have you. I don't want to do this alone either. So Queensland, as of 1 July next year, will extend to 21, that transition. And what we'll do in the meantime is we will go around Queensland meeting with young people in care, focus groups, hearing their voices, and they will design what this looks like for them. For those who are in family-based care, it will provide the opportunity for them to stay in that care arrangement if that's what they wish, and will support their carers to do so to 21. For those who are in a non-family-based situation, it will provide a caseworker support to help them with accommodation, with getting into or continuing with education, or getting the upskilling and skills that they need to get a job, as well as an allowance to assist them with accommodation, those important things. I want every young person um, in care to know that we heard you, that we listened, that our government will support you, and that we'll continue to walk alongside you as you make this transition to adulthood. Now I'd like to hand over to Jackie Reed, CEO of Create Foundation, to say a few words, and one of our Create Young Consultants, Julia, to say what this means to them. Jackie. Wow, I'm delighted at this absolutely fabulous news. And it actually is a momentous occasion for young people in Queensland. To be able to have a safety net for arguably one of the most vulnerable groups of society as they transition to independence is a great step forward for the Palaszczuk government and Minister Linnard to take. For many years, young people have been telling CREATE through endless consultations, reports, youth advisory groups, transition to independence month and so forth the same message, what their needs are as they go into the transition phase. They need to continue that support. So now the fruits of their efforts and commitment to make the system better are coming into fruition. There are many people to thank for this, mainly a government who listens. Secondly, to all those of us in the sector who have really worked towards this aim to the workers, to the carers, to the organisations, to the Home Stretch Committee, to the whole group of people that have got behind this to make it a reality. The voices of young people are so important and wise decision makers listen. Wise decision makers take action because young people should be the destiny for their future. I'd like to thank the CREATE board and team who have for over 13 years kept this firmly on our research agenda and to thank Dr McDowell for his tireless work bringing those voices of young people to reality within research and an evidence base. To work alongside the department collaboratively has meant the world to us and it's led to a great result because ultimately we've got the same goal and that's to improve the lives of children and young people in care. So massive, massive thank you to the current government and we look forward to bringing this to fruition. Thank you. Julia, do you want to say a few words? Yeah. Um, so 12 years ago I joined the CREATE Foundation to improve the children and 
lives of children and young people in foster care. Um, I was 12 years old and this is one of the first things we worked on, so literally half my lifetime. Um, so it's really great to see it's not just extending childhood um, or giving young people and young adults a pass. It's really going to improve the lives of family, young families, young mums. It's going to help young people finish education. If I had gone to grade 12, I would have still been um, in school when I aged out of the care system. So it's, I didn't get the opportunity to finish school. Uh, so it's, gonna, it's also going to support kids that are in care. Uh, the statistics are one, one third um, of people that leave foster care at 18 become homeless. So it's going to improve homelessness mental health statistics it's literally going to save people's lives so yeah it's a really great step and I'm really proud that we've come this far and yeah thank you um, I would just like to uh, finish this announcement by thanking the Premier and the Treasurer for their leadership when I took this submission forward on behalf of these young people the answer was of course, we want to make sure that young people in care know that we see them, we hear them, we're walking alongside them. And I want to finish on this note. This reform is yours. This reform is a reform that has been brought about by the voices of young people in care. And I absolutely look forward, along with my Director General, to the year ahead as we walk alongside young people, talk to them and plan and, and um, design what this will look like going forward. So thank you very much. Now, do you have any questions about this while we're here on this announcement? Sorry. Over to you. So there is, it will be upwards of $50 million over um, the forwards, but what we need to do now is, of course, the numbers change each year. About 680 people transition out of care, young people each year, and it will depend on um, the number of young people who choose to stay in their um, home-based placements and, and the number who choose to transition out of care. So. Is it, it, is it a So in this year's budget, what you will see is $200,000, and what that is about is the planning. As we you know, move around the state, as we're travelling across the state, the department will be meeting and doing those focus groups. So you will see that commitment in this budget, and as of 1 July next year, um, that's when the allowances and the additional caseworker support will be in place. Well, they're correct. Yeah. So up to 21. Thank you. Just to clarify, does that mean that um, kids are in home based, based care, that they be required to stay until they're 21 to access the additional support, or the additional support be available to them if they outside of that home base care. No, thank you. That's a great question. What this announcement is about is supporting young people, whatever that decision may be, to 21. And, uh, and that's what I think is most important about this year ahead. It won't be us designing and telling young people. It will be us meeting with young people to say, if you choose to stay in your home-based arrangement, then we will support carers, because it's about supporting carers too. There are many carers who don't let these young people go at 18 or 19. They keep the young people with them. They, you know, they worry about that transition too. We're supporting them as well. For other young people who are not in a family based care arrangement or for some who are and wish to transition, that allowance and caseworker support will be there. You mentioned about um, with some people that are going to be looking for their own accommodation, they'd be given an allowance. Is that a separate plan and do you know how much that would be? So that will be worked out with young people as to what will be included in that allowance, what will they be accessing, all of those sorts of process and procedural things will be about what this year ahead is about and that $200,000 in the budget is about that planning work that we'll do across the state with young people. You did mention that you, you know you heard that a lot of young people said it wasn't um, you know it was it was there wasn't enough support when they when they when they when they turned eighteen. What are some of the things you heard? What what, what struck you from the experience of young people? I think the thing that struck me most and still moves me uh, always is that comment about I do have two young children and when they turn eighteen, as as I did when I turned eighteen, you have that phone to pick up. And if you're struggling, and whether it is um, finding a job, whether it is meeting the costs of study, which are expensive, or as Julia said, being, you know, being a young mum, uh, you can pick up the phone to somebody. Well, not all our young people have someone to pick up the phone to. And this is about making sure that they have the start they need, secure accommodation, but also they're reaching their aspirations and building their confidence. What are the things that they want to do with their life? How do we support them through education? It's a big thing to ask someone to do all those things alone at such a young age. Mm. So I'm just really excited that they will know they are not alone. They will have case support. They will have um, the money to know that they can put food on the table. And shouldn't every young person have that. Minister, how fees reforms, which obviously are being called for by 
Indian advocate, how does that play in line with the Queensland government's, I guess, ongoing moves when it comes to dealing with um, children in the justice system? And, you know, it's all well, it's like awesome that all these kids are being supported from 18 to 21, but what about those kids that fall into, uh, you know, an unfortunate past when they're younger and are being detained from when they're 10? You know, what about criminal reform for younger children? Are you guys planning to do that? How does that play in with this? You know, this so this announcement today is about young people in care. It's about young people who are transitioning in care um, to adulthood and that they will have the ongoing supports. That, that's all that we're announcing here today and that's a really important and historic reform. Um, and I know these young people are really excited to have that additional support going forward. I mean, these young Queenslanders are some of the most vulnerable young Queenslanders across Queensland, um, you know, across the state. So this support is about making sure that they have what they need moving forward into adulthood. And I'm really proud, it's a historic statement. Um, today that we're making to those young people in care and the and the young people behind me who have lived experience so thank you so much sure if you don't mind I'll let our young consultants go is that okay yeah there you go thank you I'll come see you soon thank you thank you thank you thank you Minister the Treasurer and Deputy Premier and Premier are all unavailable today given what the Triple C announced yesterday do you think it's appropriate they're not here to answer our questions? What the government has always said and what the Premier has always said is we are absolutely open if more um, changes and measures need to be made. Queensland has some of the strongest uh, lobbying rules in the country made by Labor governments but if there is more that needs to be done the Premier herself has been clear repeatedly that we'll absolutely look at that and do that. No, absolutely not. I'm the lucky one. I get to stand out here with these gorgeous young people and make a historic announcement. I'm the lucky one. Minister and I get to make it my own electorate. So thank you for coming to Nudgee. Minister, the Triple C um, report says that contracts for the Olympics could heighten the risk of improper influence. What steps is the government taking to ensure the Olympic contracts are awarded fairly and without lobbying influence? Well, I think when we talk about lobbying, I mean, the Premier, my, re my recollection, has made the comment that if the Triple C in looking at lobbying feels that there needs to be a, a broadening of the definition of lobbying, then that's something we need to look at. But when you think about people lobby us for things all the time, we've just come from a community cabinet, community members were talking to us, whether it's local community and sporting groups. I think it's really important governments be available, um, be accessible, be listening to everyone. I, I certainly value stakeholders. I've just stood up beside one here. But there's also really really clear rules around transparency uh, and the Premier holds those um, you know with great regard and importance and reminds us as ministers about them all the time so I have no doubt that those contracts like all contracts will be awarded in accordance with appropriate rules. The Triple C has a concern that a small group of lobbyists Sorry. have disproportionate I guess, access to the government. Do they? Sorry, I missed the beginning of your question. Just, just the, one of the main triple C concerns is that a small group of lobbyists have dis disproportionate access to the partial government. Do they? No, I don't believe they do. Our government's a government that listens, and you just heard that here with this announcement. We listen, we listen to whether it's community cabinets in Stanthorpe. I've just been at a regional forum in Fraser Coast listening to stakeholders there, whether it's elected stakeholders, whether it's community members, whether it's business. A government must listen to widely and broadly to the interests of the community, and that's what we do. Events and major events that bring tourism to Queensland that are important for our economic development, of course they're things that you would expect to see any Premier at. But this Premier, I know, gets out of bed every single day, seven days a week, with the interests of Queenslanders firmly at heart. She sets a cracking pace. She is an incredibly hard-working Premier and I'm proud to serve with her. No. This Premier is known to be incredibly hard working. She is always focused on Queenslanders. And on a personal aside, if I can say there are so many things that you don't see in the media. You may see events, but what you don't see are the number of constituents, and I'm just speaking on my experience alone, that I bring to Parliament who just want to meet her, tell her their story. They might be proud of an achievement they have. She always makes time. A Premier with that much responsibility, her answer is never no when she can engage with Queenslanders. No. No, we are absolutely a united team. I love being a minister in the cabinet. I have incredibly supportive colleagues and incredibly supportive Premier. Do you expect Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk to take Labor to the 2024 election? 
Absolutely. I hope so. She's incredibly energetic. I said before, she sets a cracking pace. I say that as a minister and um, I'm absolutely proud to work alongside her and she has so much support in the community because people know that she gets out of bed every day for them. Whether it was COVID, whether it's the floods, she was just here in my electorate recently. She is always where Queenslanders need her to be most and, uh, and I love serving alongside her. Minister, just on the um, Triple C report again, what, what's the government's reaction to, to, that, to that report that you know, the risk of corruption is intensified inside the state government and mid search and lobbying? What, what, what's the government's stance on well, that? Well, we welcome that the Triple C is looking at that. I mean, they're of course looking at, and I think they said they're doing a, a, um, a, an audit of some, you know, different officers, opposition officers, as well as government. It's really important that these bodies are doing the role that they're set up to do. We are very strong um, supporters of those robust agencies. We've defended them, including when the former government would seek to not support those sorts of agencies. So um, we welcome it. And if there's any recommendations out of it that can strengthen what is already one of the strongest regimes in the country um, around lobbying, then we'll look at that. Minister, just on the Bob Atkinson review of the youth justice reform introduced last year. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so that report will be considered by government. It was announced by the Premier. It's a six-month review of implementation, so just how the implementation of those things went and, uh, and will be released in full when government's had a chance to consider it. I think what's been clear is we have very robust processes and, and a Premier who will always uh, listen and ensure we have the best and strongest processes. That's why she commissioned Professor Coldrake to do his review. I understand the, um, that review will come down at the end of this month and of course welcomes any outcomes from the Triple C process. Happy to look at that. When did you get that report from government? That report was given to government earlier this year and is currently being considered. be released as soon as government's had a chance to consider it. Well, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the incredible tragedy that that family have experienced, both of those families have experienced. And I can only imagine at a time like this that it brings that deep grief to the fore again. So my thoughts are with them and I don't want to politicise uh, that at all, that tragic loss. In regard to the Youth Justice Act, um, what we have done, I don't accept uh, the premise of the question, it is the toughest bail laws in the country. I think anybody who would objectively look at that Act and understands what's in that Act, we have the toughest bail laws in this country. We have more young people in detention than New South Wales. We have a smaller population than New South Wales, significantly more young people in detention. And that is because this government heard the concerns of community, changed that Youth Justice Act, and it has never been tougher. And calls from the opposition are absolutely false that they had a tougher um, regime when they were in um, the Youth Justice Act. They didn't. In fact, we are far tougher, and we've done that because community said we want to ensure that people aren't getting bail when they shouldn't be. That's what the presumption against bail is. is no act is perfect. No act is perfect. As a minister, I always say, every day I get up and talk to stakeholders, listen to the experts, listen to the community. That's who I work for. You know, we work for the community. If there are things that we need to do, we must always be open to listen. We must always look for the evidence and we need to always be moving forward and improving things. I don't believe you ever arrive in government. You always need to look at those things and listen. And, and I try to do that every day. So each of the states actually have a different model and they've done things differently. What we have done here in Queensland is we're not extending support to young people in certain care arrangements. It is all young people in care. And I think that's a very important distinction to make. I appreciate other jurisdictions have chosen their own way. For us, it won't just be young people in family-based care. It will also be those in non-family-based care. It's a significant decision. It will be a significant financial investment, but you can't put a dollar on investing in vulnerable young Queenslanders. So I'm I'm really proud to make this announcement. On housing, slightly different um, matter. I just wanted to ask, is the state government considering a ban on short-term leases or what further measures are being considered to address the housing crisis? What I would say in regard to housing is we're really hearing and seeing across the country the housing pressures and 
I'm sure we all know someone who has a story about how that's impacting. Of course, many of the issues are in the private market as well. As a state government, the levers we have are in regard to social housing. And we, as you know, we have a $2.9 billion commitment. We are absolutely, resolutely committing to increase social housing stocks, a commitment of 10,000 additional homes across this plan. We will do everything we can within um, the ability a state government has, but we appreciate these are much larger issues and national issues issues of housing affordability and pressure. <laughs> well, I am not the treasurer. I am not the treasurer. I would never, ever get a job on the treasurer. I leave that to him. But also, as you can imagine, I know my budget and I will be looking forward to seeing um, the many announcements across the budget, which will absolutely be focused as everything we do is on jobs and the services and infrastructure that Queenslanders deserve. Thank you so much. Thank you.